Welcome to Hard Talk. I'm Stephen Sacker. Over the years, I've come face to face with many remarkable individuals, but my guest today, Dr. William Franklin, is unique, both in terms of his longevity and his extraordinary experiences. He is a world-renowned expert on allergies. He is also one of the last remaining British survivors of the Japanese prisoner of war camps from World War II. His is a death-defying, life-affirming story. At the age of 106, what keeps him going? Dr. Bill Franklin, welcome to Hard Talk. Let me ask you first, what took you into the world of medicine? Because you said something very interesting. You said that one reason you chose to be a doctor, even though your parents had no tradition in medicine, was because you've always taken a great interest in people. Yes. Is that still true today? That, that's, that's very true. Uh, uh, I, I, I always say, when I, see, or when I was seeing ill patients, uh, to me, that was a patient with an illness which had to be helped in, 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 in some way. But whether, uh, like my most famous patient and my, my most grateful patient, uh, I said, it doesn't matter whether you're head of the state or whether you're, you're a beggar. I said this actually to him. Uh, I said, I treat you as a patient and I hope you'll follow my advice. So you, ch you chose your career, you went to Oxford, you trained as a doctor, and then, still in your 20s, the Second World War broke out. And on the eve of the war, before the war had actually been declared, I believe you made the decision to sign up. You, it seems you were eager to go to war. Why? No, I thought it was my place, and uh, in fact, I'm a, I'm a very pro-British and, and so on, so I thought, I, I, I might be called up, and I, I wasn't going to be called up. I'd been in the OTC, and I'd done what was called CMP, Civil Medical Practitioner. I'd done jobs at um, Tidworth, on the Solitary Plain, for a month. This was to earn money, uh, as well as everything else. But I thought, there's going to be war, so on, I made a regiment on the 1st of September 1939. Uh, I went into the army. That's th and war was declared on the 3rd of September, and it wasn't until November that I, and in fact the surgeon who was in, an Australian who was in the same place as me, we came up to, to the British Medical Association in London uh, and said, what can we do? We want to get into the army in uniform. Don't, we don't want to be a civilian all the time. And he just said, say that you're a GP, fill up the form and you'll get into the army quickly. And this is what we did. It's an extraordinary story. And of course, by 1941, you'd been shipped out uh, in the medical corps to Singapore to work as a young doctor, uh, helping the people of what was then, of course, a British colony but a British colony which was threatened by the Japanese. And toward the end of 41, the Japanese took Singapore. It was an extraordinarily difficult and bloody time. How lucky do you believe you were to survive? Well, I was very lucky to survive because when we arrived, in a, I mean, a journey which took actually two hours Two, two months to get to Singapore from, from Liverpool. Three days after we'd been there, a man came from, an officer, British officer, came from headquarters and said, now you two officers must start working. And we, there are two hospitals that we go to. So the officer put his hand in his pocket, took out a coin, spun it, and said, Franklin, you head, call. And I said, heads, it was heads. So I went to where I wanted to go whilst the other doctor went to the, uh, as an anesthetist, to the Alexander Military Hospital. And when the Japanese came over, they, they murdered or killed, whatever you like word to use, 
the patient, uh, when they reach the hospital, the patient first uh, in the operating theatre and then all the other people. But the, the coin toss saved your life because the other officer who lost the coin toss and went to the Alexandra Hospital, and he, was, he was killed. He was killed. Uh, he had an awful death because they, instead of putting their bone through the chest, they did it all through his abdomen. And he took Even though he was a doctor in a doctor's uniform? Oh, that made no difference at all. And, uh, and then they murdered the, the, the other doctor, some other doctors and nurses on the ground floor and, and so on. And patients too. Uh, and patients, yes, everybody. I mean, I suppose that tells us about the brutality of the Japanese invasion of Singapore. And you then were exposed to the brutality of the Japanese prisoner of war camps. You, you were held in two, Changi and then the island off Singapore that was known as Hell's Island. And that sounds like a truly unbearable existence. You were there for more than two years. How did you get through it? I just don't know. I mean, there were all these other people there, and you, I was just one, one of them. And um, compared to what we soon learned when they came back from the, the railway, the death railway, uh, where there was a 40% mortality. Uh, we That's where the prisoners were forced by the Japanese yeah. to build this railway yes. through the jungle. Yes, uh, and so I, all, I was actually detailed to go on uh, on that, but for some reason, they, they, seven days before the, they, they went up up the country to, to go on the railway, they removed my name and said, "No, I, I was a, a more suitable doctor for this. Go to this island, Black Amati, which sent us uh, Hell Island." Is Hell Island. Right? I mean, to be frank. You were, in a sense, lucky in that you were a doctor. You had medical skills, and the Japanese recognized that. And as I understand it, amid all of the suffering in the camp with the starvation rations, the malnutrition, the, the terrible fevers, dengue fever, beriberi, as well as malaria, you were doctoring. You were virtually starved, but you were still doing <laughs> the doctoring, both of inmates, the prisoners of war, but sometimes of the Japanese as well. The Japanese every now and again would bring something, to, would, would, would we treat them? It depended what it was. They knew their Japanese doctor was useless. <laughs> and they, well, let's see the prisoner of war doctor. So they would come to me. But how, how did you feel about that? These were prison guards and prison camp officers who were abusing, brutalizing you and your fellow inmates, and yet here they were sometimes asking for your help. Yeah. Uh, the answer was, what had they gotten? Could we take at least half of it or, or more of it? So it might be a, a, a medicine that we wanted. And, um, so occasionally we, we, we would treat uh, so I guess your, your focus just had to be on survival, pure and simple. Yes, at all times. Did you, now that you look back on it, and of course it's many, many years ago, do you believe you came close to death in that camp? Uh, n not in, uh, well, I will say there are three times at least I thought I was going to die, but there was only once in that camp because, I, uh, and I think it's, it has been described. We, their policy was that if our men misbehaved, nearly always stealing food, then they would have be, be bashed. But in the evening parade, we as officers were lined up, and we were also bashed because we, were, we hadn't looked after. The, the, our men well enough to tell them that they shouldn't steal food. You mean, when you say bashed, you mean physically beat? Physically. And the last time at, at Black, uh, on the island, when, when I was bashed, I, I was knocked unconscious by this. And I can't remember anything about this and how long I was on the ground. But I do remember when I had recovered halfway back to the mess where, where, I, where we were going, I met the, uh, our officer, Captain Matthews, who was in charge, and I said, that's the best bashing I've ever had because I never felt a thing, but I know I have been bashed because I've just spat out a molar or whatever it was. Um, 
And he said, you, you were very, very lucky to be alive. We thought we'd lost your doctor. And I said, why? And he said, well, when you got up, you were staggered with, with your hands, so, with, and they were fists like that, towards the Japanese officer who you'd bashed. And of course, that would certainly be. And, it, and there was a Japanese private just by him. And he was just going to put an, his bayonet through my chest. And for some reason, and I don't know why, the officer stopped him doing it. And that's why they thought they were, that I, it was the end of me. It, it, it might have been, I mean, if, if I had bashed the officer, of course, that it, certainly it would, would have been the end. Doubtless. So yeah. I, was, I, I was lucky. That was one of my, uh, I, I think I've got a guardian angel that looks after me. And that was one of the occasions when that uh, hand apparently went up and uh, he didn't put his bayonet through my chest. Well, thanks to that guardian angel or, or something, yeah. you did survive. So many men did not, but yeah. you made it through that hellish experience. And I just wonder now, and in all of the years since, did it damage you, that terrible experience? Well, I, I would say a very definite no, but in fact, when I got back to England, finally, I decided that I would never talk about anything that had happened to me. I wanted to start a new life and not look backwards. Uh, and this, so my wife and, and children knew nothing about my experience in, in the Far as a prison war at, at all. You mean nothing at all? You I never talked about it? I wouldn't talk about it. It's something that was I wanted to forget and I wanted to look in the future, not in the past. I think the main difference is a lot of these people who were worried very much by what has happened, they were, and this, this still happens up to, to this day, of course, they were very worried and they got depressed. And I've never, luckily, got depressed. So there's something in me that decides not depression. Uh, and I think that's made a, a, a terrific difference. I mean, can you honestly say after all of that experience, that, that you had no hate, you had no anger in your heart for the people who did all of this to you and your friends and comrades? Well, I've actually used this, this word hate that you use. Uh, and I say, I go about right back to the time I was aged about nine, and I had a, a, a severe disagreement with my twin brother. I can't remember what it was about. And my father found me, what was I doing, treading on his strawberries, because we each had a, a little uh, bit of the garden mm. that we, it was ours. Mm. And, he, and he said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm, I'm trying to destroy the, these strawberries because I hate my brother. And my father said, you must never, never use that word again. And so when people uh, afterwards had you must hate the Japanese. And I've said publicly, I said, no, I, my father told me never to use that word. Uh, and uh, the, reason, the reason given, of course, we, we're told as Christians that we must love and not hate. And, and that's what I've always said. So if, and I, I said, if you hate someone, it does you harm. It doesn't do them any harm at all. Let's move on from the war and those uh, unimaginable experiences. You went, uh, as you say, you, you were not depressed, you did not have psychiatric problems, you went back to medicine very quickly, you quickly rose up the ladder through, through your research and, and uh, medical expertise, and you decided to specialize in allergies. Why were you so attracted to, fascinated by Allergies. Well, when we got back to the war, uh, Porritt, uh, who, who was a, a Samaria surgeon and, and a, what was he, a general of, of, of Europe and so on, um, he had promised that all people, who, doctors who'd been prisoners of war, could go back to their teaching hospital, and mine was Samaria's at Paddington. There were various days I was free and doing nothing, and it happened that I saw on the door of the what was called the inoculation department at that time, a notice saying they wanted a, doc a doctor two mornings in the allergy clinic, two mornings a week and one afternoon. 
and I was free, so I said, all right, I'll, and I went into that. And after six weeks working in the Allied Department, I said to my chief, Dr. Freeman, could I be full time? And he said, yes. So the reason I went into biology was I, uh, per, per chance. I want to quickly talk to you about perhaps the thing that for most people listening and watching to this around the world will be the greatest benefit that they got from your research deep into allergies. You became increasingly convinced that it would be very useful given the amount of asthma, the amount of allergic reactions people were getting to the air they were breathing, and in particular the amounts of pollen in the air, you decided it was very important to measure, properly measure, the amount of pollen in the air, which ultimately gave rise to the daily pollen count, which we now see in most countries of the world as an official measure. How proud do you feel about the spread of the pollen count? Uh, rather strangely, I, I don't feel... Well, quite often people say, ah, you are responsible for the newspapers and the radio and television saying what the daily pollen count is, and that you sorted it. And I don't think this was uh, necessary, having done pollen counts daily. And, and because people are very vague, well, if you watch the history, when do your symptoms start? In the spring. Well, if you're an American, spring is different from spring in England. But I said, I want the exact time. And men are measurably wrong quite often. And we saw that a lot of people are getting tree pollen sensitive and so on and, uh, and, and other things. Your work, your connection of specific pollen counts with the spread of hay fever and, and asthmatic conditions, it has been very important. Do you suffer from hay fever yourself? Yes, I do. Did you, did you think that was one reason you were so interested in this? No, it's not a reason at all. Although well, I've had it for 90 years, but I've grown out of it <laughs> without treatment. No, um, here, here was a complaint which we could give a good result if we got the history right. And one of the things I used to do on a Saturday find out that when people came back and had a bad history, why did they have a bad history? And it's fascinating to go back and find out the reason. But what's also fascinating is the degree to which the studies suggest that allergies of all types, but particularly airborne problems uh, connected to both pollen but, but to pollution, and then one can look at food allergies, the spread, you know, it seems more people now suffering from various food allergies, from nuts to gluten to all sorts of things. It's tempting almost to believe that more and more people are becoming allergic to the 21st century environment around them. Why do you think more and more people appear to be suffering from allergies? Well, the in all countries, this is, looks as though it's, it's happening for various reasons. And one of the reasons is the so-called hygiene hypothesis, that if babies are born in very clean places and so on, they, they, well, we have to think of a cow. A cow must feed its calf for the, to get the, all the antibodies and so on. If, you're living, if a baby is living in a very clean place, it doesn't get immune, from an immunity point of view, an immunological point of view, it's not getting protection. Brings me to a very interesting element of your research over the years. You were a doctor who always seemed to believe in the notion of desensitization, that is exposing people to a little bit, a little, little bit of what was causing them problems in the hope that it would allow the body to build up its own natural resistances. I, I believe I'm right in saying that at one point in your career you exposed yourself to tropical insects and the kinds of bites they had in the hope that you could use yourself as a test case of how the body would react. Yes, the reason I did this, uh, I'm an allergic person, and I'm, but if, if a mosquito bites me or a bug of any sort bites me, uh, I found this in Singapore very much to sit, sit in a chair and you find your buttocks are, uh, itching and so on. So I wanted to know what was the natural history of these insect bites. As I, at, at the time, I'd never been to South America, 
uh, and I therefore got an insect that is quite common in, in North and South America and some of the southern states of U the USA. And I'd never met it before. I got it from the School of Medicine in London. And every Monday morning, I kept it in the test tube. I let it have a feed from me. It's a very slow feeder. A feeder. Um, and so I could follow the whole process of in this insect, in me, what happened. Uh, and the first, feel, first time it had its meal from me, all these insects, just before they take the, their blood from mm. you, they put in a tiny bit of their own saliva. Mm. This, this is what causes the trouble, in fact. Mm. Anyhow, the, the, first insect, the first bite meal that it had from me, no response at all. And that's what one would expect, because I'd never met it before. Second bite, yes, a delayed response. And that got more and more larger and larger every week until my arm was on the fifth bite swollen for three days from, from the bite. And so with the eighth bite, the question was, I was hoping I might be desensitized and, and nothing would happen. But to be absolutely certain, um, I went into the side ward of the hospital to see what happened. And it, uh, it, it, it produced, uh, I remember taking the cotton ball out and it ran down the test tube and, and began its meal. And in five or six minutes, the, the nurse who had taken my blood pressure said, the machine is broken. And uh, I, I felt my pulse, well, I hadn't got a pulse. And then, my, then I realized my face was swelling up, my body was swelling up. And I couldn't speak. You were in full-scale prophylactic shock. Uh, yes. <laughs> well, so you, you basically, you nearly I, killed yourself. I, I nearly did, yes. But in fact, very luckily, and I, the nurse ran out. She thought she, to find a sister, sister in the ward to come along. And I remember she came to see me and said, uh, oh, you've done some silly experiment. That's why you wanted this room. Um, what you require is it, and I'll give you one cc. And she said, I'll give you... Point three is what you want. And I must say, just before she gave it to me, I had what the textbooks call a feeling of impending doom. In other words, you think you're going to die. You thought you were going to die. Yes, I thought I was going to die. And she gave me this as an injection. And in about a minute and a half, I decided, no, I'm not going to die. <laughs> well, thank goodness <laughs> and, you did. Uh, that story of how you, as a research doctor, almost killed yourself, it, it it's, uh, will stay with me for a long time. But I want to, before we finish, I want to ask you this. You are extraordinary, because here you sit with me. You're the oldest guest I've ever interviewed on Hard Talk at 106. And yet, physically and mentally, you're in terrific shape. How, people around the world will want to know how you have stayed so fit, mentally and physically, for so long? I, I just say it's luck. Uh, I've been so near death so many times, and because I've missed th th these occasions, uh, I, I'm, I'm very, very lucky. The other thing is, uh, I try and keep my brain going. In fact, I wrote four academic papers in between 100 and 105. Well, two of them entirely myself and the others were multiple authors and so on. But this, when I'm 107, I've got two more papers <laughs> that I'm going to write. Oh and I've, I've nearly finished one of them. I don't get the impression you've lost your love of life. No, I, 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 at present I don't want to die. Uh, and I, I want my, these two articles to, to come out. And, that, I'll be, be proud of, 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 those, of that. Mm. Well, Dr. Bill Franklin, it has been a real privilege to talk to you. Thank you for being on Hard Talk. Well, thank you too.